So, um, Skip, I'll have you introduce our guest speaker for this evening. Okay. Um, one of the great things about conventions is as long as you don't sit at the table with all of the friends that you have from the home club, you get to meet somebody new. And a couple of years ago, I met this guy, and I looked at this call, and I said, I have seen that call before. Turns out W2APF was a very famous uh, radio shop owner in Albany, New York, back in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, and we started trading notes and found out that uh, Thayer's house is uh, about 20 miles north of my house up in New Hampshire. And we resolved to get together. And a couple of weeks later, I shot him an email, and I got no reply. And a couple of weeks later, I shot him an email, and I got no reply, and I said, yep, I've been stiffed again. <laughs> well, come Christmas time, I got an email from him, and it said, sorry, we weren't around to answer your email. We were in China. And we can't get together until after the first of the year, because uh, we're going to Antarctica. And I said, this is an interesting guy to know. <laughs> Uh, there's an allograph collector and a columns collector. Uh, he started out life as a fish salesman, retired out of the grocery business, and decided to start traveling. And he is, as you can see on the on the uh, title to his slide, he's done a little bit more than certainly I have, and probably most of us have. Uh, bottom line: one heck of a good guy, one heck of a good ham. And, uh, and, and when we get to the Montserrat QSL card, you'll find out that he's got a sense of humor because he lists it as volcanoes on the air. <laughs> so, no further ado, Thayer Bryant, W2APF. Thank you. Well, thank you. Could you come over here and, and I'll slip slides? Yeah. You're going to need a chair. Yeah. hit the down button we're going to go through them okay okay good evening thanks for having me here I love talking about amateur radio I didn't get started as early as you did Nathan but I got in late and it's been one of the most exciting parts of my life for the last almost 44 years I, I, I grew up at a time where we didn't have television until I was older than six or seven years old I'm sure some of the rest of you, maybe not many of you, but some of you can remember that. I listened to the Lone Ranger and Buster Brown on the radio. I didn't have any cartoons, but I was thrilled by it. Uh, a lot of kids' programs, I grew up in Lake Placid, came out of Montreal, and every Saturday morning, I had my ear pinned to the radio listening to the Lone Ranger, Buster Brown, and others. T title tonight is Operating Portable Anywhere in the World, and I've, I've been blessed to be able to travel. I, in preparing for this talk tonight, I went through my old log books. I only went to a computer log a year and a half ago, <laughs> so I had a lot to go through. And I pinned down all the places I'd worked portable, most of the time without mains, without um, main electricity, most of the time on batteries. One, two, three, four, six, seven, and eight call areas in the U.S., Antarctica, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, Alaska, Newfoundland, all up through Atlantic Canada, all through the Caribbean, into Europe, even Africa, uh, the one Canary Island, Fuerteventura, 40 miles off the coast of Africa. We, we spent a month there uh, just before COVID started. There's a typo here. I have VP8 MBU and VP8 MDX. It's supposed to be MB, M, MP, VP2. The first one is Montserrat in 1994. The second one, VP8, VP2 MDX is Montserrat from this past year where we spent six weeks in, in January and February. I'm lucky enough through changes in local regulatory affairs that Victor 47 Juliet Romeo is my call sign for the island of Nevis in the Caribbean for life. 
not here, because I neglected to put it on, is VP8 DML, which is my call sign for life in the Falkland Islands. Now, unfortunately, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to go back there. <laughs> we were lucky enough to go there once. Uh, through, through Europe, Scotland, uh, beaches all over the world, park benches, picnic areas, poda. Nathan said he's doing some soda. Uh, cruise ships and sailboats, any place that I could operate away from home, I had a great time. Next. Here's just a couple of the QSL cards I've used over the years. Uh, whoop. Uh, whoop. Go back. Okay. Uh, Italy, uh, Nevis, uh, CT8 is the Azores, VP2 MDX is, is uh, Montserrat. Next. Uh, tonight's presentation, first of all, a little bit of background, how I got involved in amateur radio, uh, how I got involved with QRP and, and kit building, uh, changes in equipment over the years, uh, antenna help for operating portable, uh, how to get licensed out of the U.S., what you need to go through, and then hopefully we'll have time for a few questions. Next. My first, I got my novice license really late, uh, Christmas 1984. Uh, my first QSO, and I have these because I looked them up in the logbook, uh, KA5 TRT, Independence, Louisiana. I got my general eight months later in July of 85. First QSO was Tel Aviv, Israel. I was off to the races. I, I could, you can't imagine how excited I was. I, I, I felt like I was Nathan's age. And I was in my mid-30s and, and having this much fun. I waited till I retired to get my, my extra. I, I didn't feel I needed it. General gave me the privileges I wanted. But when I retired, I knuckled down, studied, went out to Dayton, took the test, waited 45 minutes to have one of the inspectors come out and tell me I'd failed. He said, you only got two right. I said, that's mathematically impossible. Go back in. Well, I realized that I, the, the print on the test they gave me was fairly large. Well, it turned out it was for visually impaired people, and it was a different answer key. Turned out I had just two wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so that gave me a lot more privileges. And Nathan, you're going to find out that it, it makes sense to get the, get the extra, if for nothing else, for the extra privileges you get. All those extra slots in CW. As I said earlier, no TV till six or seven. I had a middle school friend when I was in seventh or eighth grade whose dad was a TV repairman. He got licensed, and he didn't really spend a whole lot of time at it. But it made such an impression on me that 50 years later, I can remember his call sign. Whiskey November 2 VIE. I saw him about 10 or 15 years ago. He didn't remember it at all. I still remember his call sign. Back in the, in the 70s, I married Debbie, my wife. Her grandfather, as Skip said, was Uncle Dave Marks, W2APF. He started Uncle Dave's Radio Shack in Albany, New York in the 30s. In the 20s, he had a business called People's Radio Store. In 1955, he was sued by Radio Shack Corporation because he was using Radio Shack, which he had used for 30 years. He never copyrighted it. So he had to change it, changed it to Fort Orange Radio. At that same time in the 50s when Uncle Dave had his shop in Albany, there was another shop in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, owned by a fellow named Paul Warhola. He had a business selling, clearing estates. Somebody would die, they'd clear out the house, sell everything. And as a sideline, he had a radio store, an electronic store, selling amateur radios, receivers, etc. Paul Warhola was Andy Warhol's brother. First club I got involved with, well, actually, when, when we bought our first house in North Weymouth, Massachusetts, down the road, three or four houses away from us was a tri-band beam sticking out of the top of a house. As soon as I had time, I went down, knocked on the door, introduced myself, and told them I wanted to have a license. Hal Jones, WB1ABM, helped me get that first novice license, helped me set up my first station, got me a, as, 
got me to join the South Shore Amateur Radio Club, where I met a whole lot of folks who were first licensed when there weren't any W's. They were licensed before 1927. 19, the end of 27, 28 is when the W was added to our call signs. I was telling Skip earlier, we had two meetings every month. The first meeting was our official meeting at the Viking, Viking Club. The second meeting was when I picked up three or four of the other guys and we went to say our respects at the funeral of one of our older members. <laughs> Next, please. First radio I had was a Heath kit HW8. If you were lucky, two watts. Uh, the good thing was it taught me CW. I, I said I, it took me eight months to, to get my general. For eight months I was CW only. It certainly helped me get off on the right foot. The HW8 was really a great radio. It replaced the HW7, which was a piece of crap. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and also, later they came out with the HW9 that was really fantastic. This I loved, and I, I, I don't have the original, but I was able to pick up another one a few years ago, and I still use it occasionally. One, one night, my, my day job was in food service distribution for a company called Cisco. You've probably seen their trucks around. You've probably heard them on the news lately. There's a big strike going on down there now. I. Uh, Amateur radio kept me sane through 40 years in the food service business. One night about 3 o'clock in the morning, I couldn't sleep. I got up, I went down to the radio shack, plugged in my HW8. We're in North, we North Weymouth, Massachusetts. And I hear a VK on 20 at 3 in the morning. So I tried, and he came back to my call. We started chatting. A VK is Australia. So. I tell him I'm in North Weymouth, Mass, tell him my name, and he says, what street do you live on? I said, what street? He's got a different log book than I have. <laughs> I said, Sanding Road. And he said, well, the reason I ask, and, the, and I was struggling, but I kept up. In World War II, he was in the Australian Army. He married a, a U.S. woman who had been a nurse in the U.S. Army. She grew up in North Weymouth, Massachusetts one street away from where we lived. The next summer, she came home to visit her family. She hand-delivered the QSL card. Those are the kind of things that keep you involved in this hobby for the rest of your life. Next. Uncle Dave, knowing I was interested, and every time Debbie and I would go over and visit him, I'd spend the whole weekend down in the radio room with him. Now, when, when we first started, he had Collins, but he very, very early in 78, he switched over to Kenwood, a Kenwood 930, soon followed by a 940, a 922 linear. But he had a Collins 30S1. That's the big Collins kilowatt that's a hernia and a half to move. It weighs about 180 pounds. He gave that to me and said, you can sell this and it'll get you your first station. How many people remember Rivendell in Salem, Joe? Well, I went up to Joe, he put it for sale, and he sold it and got $1,500 for me for it, which was a lot of money back then. It was enough to buy an ICOM 745, 38 feet of Roan 25, a rotor, a TA33 Junior, a power supply, and a key. All for $1,500, and I was off to the races. Unfortunately, I found out that the 30S1 had been sold to a guy named, whose call was K1MAN, <laughs> Glenn Baxter. It took the FCC till 2014 to take his license and collect the fines he had built up, destroying the airwaves for all of us. Pardon me? <laughs> no, no, with, with that amplifier, I'm sure, at times. <laughs> Next, please. Uncle Dave was really one of the pioneers of amateur radio. Uh, back in the 20s, I remember him telling me stories when he and friends would steal the condensers out of payphones so they could make microphones. I found him first licensed in 1928, but I'm sure he bootlegged for 10 years before that. World War I, they shut down amateurs from 1917 to 1919. 
1919, he was back on the air, but he didn't get a license till the end of 27, early 28. There were a lot of guys that didn't. I, it's generally not well known, and it's, it's a topic for another discussion. But the authorities at the time were more interested in stations along the coast where you could interfere with commercial and military stations, mm. which was basically ship to shore. Okay? So if you were in the middle of the country, nobody really cared. Mm. So well, he, he finally got legal, <laughs> and, and he, uh, as a Collins dealer, he started in the, in the late 30s, early 40s selling Collins, and any Collins manual you pick up today will have Uncle Dave's Radio Shack or Ford Orange Radio listed in the back as, as some of the dealers that they've, they've had. He also started a, an op, a, a nonprofit called Operation Goodwill, where he, using radio, he was able to get medicine to people around the world who needed it. He got involved in things like the Johnston, Pennsylvania flood, uh, floods and earthquakes in South America. Uh, during the Vietnam War, he taped messages for troops in Vietnam and, and had them all shipped over to, to Vietnam so they could get messages from their families. Uh, he was a great guy, a great businessman. When he, when he finished and sold his business in the mid-60s, he became a travel agent because he found out they gave free trips to travel agents. <laughs> and he traveled around the world. About 15 or 20 years ago, I got a letter from a fellow who was a QSL Bureau volunteer in what was then Czechoslovakia. He said, I saw your card coming through for so-and-so. He said, in 1964 or 5, your grandfather came to Czechoslovakia and spent a day with me trying to work out uh, tours for American tourists to come to Czechoslovakia. And he remembered it 30, 30, 40 years later. Unfortunately, Dave passed in 1992, and I was able, because of the FCC's family rule, to apply for the license, and I picked it up in 93. Next. I found this listing for Uncle Dave in the 1960 call book. Have VFO will travel. <laughs> now I know where I got the urge. Does anybody remember the 1960s Western TV show that he got that from? Paladin, have gun, will travel. <laughs> and travel he did. Next. Oop, you went back. Go back one. No, go back one. Okay. I started getting, because of the HW8, I started getting interested in QRP. And then in the, in the early 80s, I started becoming aware of a lot of QRP radio clubs around the world, most notably the GQRP, the English QRP Club, with their periodical Sprat, the ARCI, American Radio Club International QRP Quarterly. They're the folks that give us four days in May, the QRP four-day symposium every year at Dayton. 72, the New England QRP Club. I, I think they're still in operation. They stopped publishing a long time ago. The Michigan QRP Club, the Five Waters, still comes out. And for quite a while in the 80s and 90s, the Northern California QRP Club came out with NorCal. This, th these groups started a huge resurgence in building, kit building, and experimenting. An awful lot of people got into amateur radio because of these folks and started operating portable because they ended up with rigs that you could take anywhere. Next. This is one of the first small ones I built. It's by Dave Benson, Small Wonders Lab. But all of these were small, lightweight. They were battery powered. You didn't need to plug them in any place. They were mostly CW, all five watts or less, a lot of them down to two or three or even milliwatt levels. They were simple to complex kits, but you could get help with any of them from any people. Dave Benson would help anybody. Uh, a lot of vendors came online. I talk about this and a few others because I had the most, the most familiarity, familiarity with them. And they were mostly inexpensive. This little SW30 
I think was about 70 bucks or 60 bucks, which is affordable and it got somebody on the air and with a little bit of wire and an antenna tuner or a, or a resident antenna, you were off to the races. Next. Dave Benson, as I said earlier, K1SWL, he was first licensed as NN1G. Started out first with the SW series, and then he enhanced that a little bit with the SW+. Anybody remember the Rock Mites? About the size of half a pack of cigarettes, rock bound, 500 milliwatts, but they worked. <laughs> you, could, you could have a QSO. I, I, when people ask me about QR, QRP, I say it's a lot like hot air ballooning. You could always get from here to there as long as you don't care where there is. <laughs> There's always somebody else at the other end of that QSO. Uh, a lot of them, as, you got, as they got more, more sophisticated, had audio frequency readout, uh, the keyers went into them, variable power out from zero to four watts or five watts. They're all very low current dr draw, so you could work on a battery for an awfully long time. Uh, none of them at that point had ATUs, antenna tuners, so you needed either a resonant antenna or an antenna tuner. In the front of this group is an Elecraft T1, the, the, which is a great little antenna tuner. Uh, the, the, the first one is an SW, the second is an SW+, uh, where they added, um, a keyer was added, and the last one is a SW80, plus that we've added a, a, a keyer, some filtering, variable power out, and a few other things. It, it's a great little rig on 80, 80 meters. Next. All of them got me on the air. Dave's best were the DSW-2s. These had audio frequency readout. Push a button, it told you what frequency you were on. They're all single band. Uh, these two are 20 and 40, four watts out. Even the ugly ones work. On the right is an Epiphyte 2, uh, designed by Derry Spittle in Vancouver, British Columbia. It was a kit out of the GQRP club back in the, I guess, the early 2000s. Uh, it's a five watt, 75 meter, single sideband. I use it to check into the seagull net in Maine at, once or twice a week. Next, next Wayne Burdick came in, got involved. He, he and, and Eric Schwartz were both members of the Northern California QRP Club. And w Wayne started by putting together a kit called the SST, available in a variety of frequency bands. All, again, only single, single bands. Expanded to a NorCal 40, and it did so well that he started a separate company with Bob Dyer called Wilderness, Wilderness Radio, and they started producing kits for the Wilderness 40A. That had audio frequency readout, it had filtering, it had a keyer uh, for 40 meters. Uh, it was it, it just an absolutely sharp receiver. It was a fantastic rig. And next. Then he came out with the Wilderness Sierra, all band with plug-in modules similar to the um, um, Argonaut that Tentec came out with. Uh, you had to wind a lot of toroids, but you got an all-band all transceiver. It had, a, it had a digital readout. Uh, it, it, it was a fun radio to use. It traveled anywhere. Again, low power consumption, but you still needed an ATU with it. Next. In 1998, uh, Eric and Wayne got together, started Elecraft, and came out with an incredible rig called the K2. Uh, this was all band, 160 through 10, CW, sideband. It had a built-in ATU. I had memories and filtering, low power consumption, an incredibly hot receiver, very portable. Later, they added a 100 watt amplifier and a 100 watt ATU. My first one I got in 1998. Fairly complex, but still not an impossible build. 
Uh, second one, I was by that time very busy with Cisco and uh, one of the fellows who worked for Elecref built me a, a second with the, a, the ATU and the 100 watt, uh, 100 watt amplifier. Uh, I had both for many years, used them, and I only sold them when the K3 came out and I've had buyer's remorse ever, or seller's remorse ever since. I, to the point where just this past uh, six or seven months ago, I found one for sale, loaded, brand new, built by somebody who knew what they were doing, and it's back on my bench and I use it regularly. Uh, this, this really helped to travel because now you had one small package with the ATU, all bands, and you could go just about any place in the world, plug in a battery into it and, and be on the air. This, this radio went with me to to Nevis, it went with me to Scotland. Uh, it uh, it went to Costa Rica and uh, and Canada. Next, have VFO will travel. Uh, the K2 also went to Ravello on the Melfi coast in Italy, uh, the Osa Peninsula in the Costa Rica. Uh, Corsano in Italy, and also to Alaska two or three times, and to Arizona. Next. After that, they came out with the K2, which was a simpler build, two band or four band, uh, had an internal antenna tuner, uh, five watts filtering, a keyer. It was an easier build. Uh, I had both the two band and the four band. I sold the four band and I still have a two band that's 30 and 17, two of my favorite CW bands. Uh, it also, on a trip to Arizona, gave me my first and only contact with, with South Korea, HL. And that's with a little wire up and a cactus someplace. Next. Uh, then Elecraft came out with the KX-1. Uh, again, it was a fairly, fairly interesting and simple build until you added 80 meters and you had, to, you had to be really dexterous to get the small parts in there, but it all fit. It's about the size, just a little bigger than, puts out about three or four watts, CW only, 80, 40, 30, and 20. It has a, its own keyer, key connected. You can use it with internal batteries. I just don't like keeping internal batteries in a, in a radio when I'm not, unless I'm going to be using it someplace. So with a pair of earphones and a wire thrown up in a tree or, or over a bush, you are on the air and transmitting. I took this on a, on a Mediterranean, Mediterranean cruise about 2006. And on one day, we were supposed to, it was supposed to be a three-hour bus trip to Delphi. Didn't sound like fun in 110 degrees. So another couple, my wife and I, went to a beach nearby. I took out my little KX-1, threw a wire up in an olive tree, and I was working a string of Russians. <laughs> the owner of the hotel came out and said, what you do? I looked at him and I said, Baseball, baseball, strike one, strike two. <laughs> he looked at me and he said, I don't believe you. <laughs> well, I got him talking about, I said, what sports do you like? He said, he liked, he liked the Nets. I said, not the Celtics? He said, no, the Nets. So we talked about basketball for a while and he left me alone to work some more stations. Uh, I've taken this with me to the Hebrides. I, a little later, I'm going to mention a friend of mine I met on 10 meter FM many, many years, 25, tw no, uh, 33 years ago. Uh, we traveled with him on his sailboat over four years, all over the outer Hebrides and the inner Hebrides on the west coast of Scotland. I always brought this and a, a, a simple doublet antenna that I, I hung up on the top of the mast and every single night I, I made contact around Europe. Next. Well, as a matter of fact, with that little KX-1, last weekend I got a little curious putting this talk together. I, I pulled it out, stuck it on an antenna, 
plugged in a battery and worked three or four stations and the work all Germany with two and a half watts. Uh, this is a cruise we took with one of our granddaughters. Uh, it's a, a Lindblad cruise to the Arctic. This is 80 degrees north on the north side of Spitsbergen Island archipelago. Uh, we were literally 600 miles from the, the North Pole. Uh, KX-1, small antenna held up with some, some uh, tent, tent poles, and I managed making half a dozen contacts from there. That was one of the times I wasn't, able to, I wasn't allowed to work on the, to operate on the boat, but every time we went ashore, because of some licensing rules I'll, I'll tell you about later, I was able to set it up and, and go to town. Next. This is Jim Williamson. Uh, as I said, I met him in 1988 on 10 meter FM. Uh, he was a Scottish agricultural advisor. Uh, he also was a, was a world-class sailor. Uh, we, he traveled with us, the Caribbean, all over the US, all over Scotland. Uh, from 2009 to 2013, every year we took a long cruise on his, on his sailboat. Uh, he was the kind of guy that could steer through a Force 12 gale and rebuild the Yamaha diesel with one hand as he was doing it. Uh, absolutely tremendous guy. He had gotten a, a commission. He was a, a licensed yacht captain. He got a commission to sail a 60-foot yacht from Ascension Island back to the UK. And he was in line in the post office putting in his paperwork when he had a heart attack. He was the, he was the happiest he'd been in his entire life. Uh, just a super guy, um, and again, it's, it's, the, it's the contacts that I've made over the years, and I'm sure all of you have with your radios that make this such an absolutely inspiring and, and, and fantastic hobby. Next. Oh, by the way, Jim, Jim and his wife came to our daughter's wedding. He wore his kilt. She wore a pantsuit. <laughs> <laughs> This is the little KX-1 again. Uh, we're on a small island group in the middle of what's called the Minch. It's the body of water between mainland Scotland and the Outer Hebrides. Uh, uninhabited island had been used for sheep raising for the last 800 or 900 years. Um, we sailed in, there was a, there's one small house on the island that was being used by some bird watchers. Uh, just threw up the 30-foot the, uh, mast, the DK9SQ uh, fiberglass mast, <coughs> a doublet, the KX-1, and it worked all over Europe. On one of the other trips with the KX-1, every night I would raise the antenna, go on the radio. Every night for this six or seven day trip, the first fellow I met each night on CW was a guy named Joe, 87 years old, in the Slovenia. Every single night we got home. The first call I heard when I turned on the radio at home was the same guy, Joe. I hope he's still pounding keys. Next. In 2011, Ellicraft introduced the KX3. This, this brought a whole new dimension to portable radio. Uh, the KX3 was compact, 160 through 6 meter. Uh, you could add 2 meter to it, so you had a 2 meter all mode as well. 15 watts on a battery. Uh, incredible filtering, an incredible hot receiver. Uh, it was an SDR, so by hooking it up to a computer, you could download more firmware, firmware to make it do additional things. Uh, later on, they came up with additions. Uh, a, a PX3, which is a pan adapter, and a, KX, a KPXA100, a 100 watt amplifier and, and, and antenna tuner. With that, and I've got them up here, with the, with the 100 watt amplifier, it's a, it's a complete base station, but it travels in that, that one package, that one carry on on an airplane. Uh, I've also used, without the an, antenna amplifier, or the power amplifier, I've used this little case to carry it in around the world. We took this one to Australia with us, and it, it was incredible. And to give you an idea of the service of these folks, we took, our, we took each of our grandchildren on a big trip when they turned 12. 
Uh, the oldest one, because she's very fair skinned, Irish and red hair and burns, if, if she sees a picture of the sun, we took her to the Arctic. Uh, the next one we took to the Galapagos and Machu Picchu. The youngest, a boy, as soon as he realized the program started lobbying for Australia. So we ended up going across to Australia and then taking a cruise up the northwest coast of Australia across to East Timor and into Indonesia. I was on a small island off the coast, the northwest coast of Australia. I'd worked a string of Japanese and all of a sudden I got a high power warning and the rig shut down. I kept fiddling and fiddling. Every time I turned it on, high power, it shut down. So I went back to the, to the ship, took it apart, couldn't find anything wrong. Out of desperation, just before dinner, I emailed Wayne Burdick and said, this is where I am, this is what happened. Now I had installed the two meter module about three weeks before the trip, and I told him that. Three hours later, at what was probably three in the morning California time, Wayne answered my email saying we got a we got a bad we found out we had a bad batch of power amplifier chips in the in the two meter module. Uninstall it and you'll be fine for the rest of the trip. When you get back, mail it back to us and we'll make it right. I did that and it worked the rest of the trip. Uh, and when I got back, they he did what he said. They they repaired the whole thing, sent it back, covered all the costs. Uh, that's the kind of service that, that I've, I've come to enjoy from these folks. Next. As I said, the second daughter, granddaughter, went to Ecuador, the Galapagos, and to Machu, Peru and Machu Picchu. Problem with Ecuador is they're not very friendly to Americans. They're not very friendly for amateur radio. Uh, not only was it not possible to get a license to operate, you weren't even supposed to have a radio with you in Ecuador. So I had to smuggle the KX3 into and out of Ecuador. Once I got to Peru through an IARU, International Amateur Radio Union certificate from the ARRL, I was able to use the SEP system, which I'll talk about in a bit, get licensed for Peru so that I could operate about 500 feet above Machu Picchu. I worked a string of Swiss, German, and Italian stations from there with a buddy pole vertical and, and 10 watts of power. Next. <coughs> About that time, Ellicraft came out with what I thought was the last radio I would ever need, the K3. Uh, it, it was a rig of choice for every major de-expedition around the world for many years uh, and still is. Uh, it, it software defined, uh, new, new uh, features could be added just by downloading the firmware and installing it. Uh, it came out in 2008. Uh, I used it for 10 years, flawless, not a single problem. Uh, and in 2018, upgraded to a K3S, which I again thought was the last radio I was ever going to need. Uh, had the K3S until uh, 20, until one year later, they announced the K4 coming out. Well, I waited two years, two months, and two, and two weeks. And last, uh, a year ago, last May, I got, last June, I got my, my K4D. And I think that's the last one I'm ever going to need. <laughs> Uh, these, these, these had the filtering, had the re receive, receive ability to be able to work just about anybody you could hear any place in the world. In 2010, as Skip mentioned earlier, uh, I retired the end of 2009 and in, in, in planning a big trip to celebrate my retirement, uh, we went on a Lindblad Cruise, National Geographic Lindblad, to Antarctica and the Falkland Islands. I had worked with, with Lindblad ahead of time, and I had been told that there was a, an ICOM vertical, an AH-1 antenna tuner, already installed on the bridge, and an ICOM 706 there that I could use, and that they also had 
a stepper vertical that they would help me erect on land when we, when we went ashore. Well, I ended up bringing my own, my, my uh, K3, and I got a new antenna at that time. It was a, a vertical dipole from TW Antennas. Uh, DX Engineering sells them now. It was probably the best choice to take because there's no trees to hang antennas from in Antarctica. No, nothing any taller than a penguin any place you went. Pardon me? Yeah, they, it very, not very many trees. <laughs> not very many trees. So when we got to the ship, I found, first of all, the last refit, somebody had stolen the antenna and the antenna tuner and the, and the 706. So there was no question of being able to operate on the, on the ship. I went to look for the vertical, the, the stepper vertical, and that was in pieces and most of it was gone. So unfortunately, the only way I could operate was on land. And I did. I operated, if you go to the next one, the next, I operated in uh, four parts on the, on the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, Cooverville Island, Pourquoi Pa Island, Red Rock Ridge, and then on Deception Island. Deception Island is the uh, island that had been an extinct volcano. There was a whaling station there. Uh, you could sail right into the caldera. I set up my, my, my radio very close, my station very close to where the whaling station was. Every time we went ashore, I had two able-bodied seamen and a Zodiac. We'd lose two marine batteries, my radio kit, my antenna, a chair and a table, <laughs> go ashore. I'd set up my station and I would work as long as the shore party stayed there. Unfortunately, they, on this trip, they only went ashore in the mornings. Propagation didn't really start till the afternoon. So there wasn't a whole lot of activity just into southern South America until we got to the Falklands. And then from the Falklands, I was able to work as far as the Maldives and up into northern uh, Argentina and other parts of South America. And then when we got back, uh, this was 2010, when we got back to Ushuaia, the southern part of South America, there was a huge earthquake centered in Santiago, Chile. It closed down every airport in South America. We got marooned in Ushuaia for five days. You know, they, they, they fed us, they, they opened the bar, they made little side trips. Uh, five of us got together, rented an airplane and a pilot and flew over the Andes. Uh, we, we were telling everybody the, the uh, movie was gonna be Snakes on a Plane and Alive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, but I was able to work from, Louis, from uh, LU, Ar Argentina, while we were waiting for the plane to come down and bring us back. Next. There you can see the, the TW antenna. It was 30 through 10, uh, a vertical dipole, set up easily, and it, it worked well for the, for the location that we had. Uh, I don't know if the stepper, stepper vertical would have given me that much more. Next. This is on South Georgia Island. Uh, I was able to operate four places on South Georgia. And this one, you can't see the fur seals, pups that are trying to chew the coax, but there's a bunch of penguins that were watching the entire operation. And it, it was snowing a little bit there, which is why I had the, the plastic bags over the radio. Next. There, did you, did you get to uh, Shackleton's grave? Uh, yes, not only did we get to Shackleton's grave, uh, we, we did the last part of Shackleton's hike over the top of South Georgia and down from, from wow. way up above, down through Shackleton's waterfall and down in. Uh, we, we made a quick libation over his grave. <laughs> For those of you who are familiar with Shackleton, he he went first to the to Antarctica with with uh, with Scott's first expedi expedition, and he got sick, and Scott treated him really badly for that. So he he came back with his own expedition, and the ship got caught in the in the uh, ice, broke up, sunk. But Shackleton, for the leader he was, 
brought every single member of that crew back alive. And to do it, he got them as far as Elephant Island. Now today, we, we visited Elephant Island. Storms have taken, over, taken out most of the coast, coastline, so there was no place even to stand on the island. And the funny thing was, there's a statue there to the captain of the Kelso, the tugboat that came and rescued the folks. But there's no statue to Shackleton, who got his men all the way there. And then on a 12-foot boat, the James Caird sailboat sailed 800 miles with pen and paper navigation to get to South Georgia, landed on the wrong side of South Georgia, had to climb peaks as high as the Alps, with three guys, and to make it worse, he took the three worst guys and the worst people in the group because he knew if he left them there, they'd cause problems. <laughs> so he took them with him, climbed all the way up over the top, came down, introduced himself to the folks at Gritviken. They didn't recognize him. You know, he'd been, it was over a year. Uh, and it took him another eight months, to, or six months, I think, to get somebody to come back with a ship to save his folks and bring them back to England. Unfortunately, many of them died in World War I after going through all that and getting back, getting back home. This is Carcass Island of the Falklands. Uh, Debbie was able to photograph seabirds while I worked the Maldives. That was, this was probably one of the nicest amateur radio adventures I've had. There's been a lot of them, but this is one I'll remember for a long time. Uh, next, Ellicraft, back in 2020, introduced the KX-2. KX-2, 80 through 10, FM, single sideband, CW, data, all the filtering, low power consumption, 10 watts out, uh, everything a full-size transceiver would have, and it only weighs about 13 ounces. It's also, as you can see here, it's not that much bigger than the KX-1. And I've, I've set this up here so afterwards, I think we'll have time, everybody will be able to take a peek at this stuff. Uh, this is my go anywhere radio now. Every time we travel, I may bring one of the bigger stations for, for a, a base station if we're gonna stay someplace for a week or two. But this always goes in a little pack. Uh, just uh, three weeks ago, I was in Dingle, Ireland on, on a beach, it was too cold for swimming, so the lifeguards didn't show up that day. I ran an NFED up their, their flagpole and worked stations all over Europe in the middle of a rainstorm from the, from the car with the, the little KX2. Uh, it, it's, it's been with me uh, to uh, Copenhagen last summer after Friedrichshafen. Uh, we used it there, we used it in the Black Forest and every place you can put a wire up in the air, you can find somebody to, to work on the other end. Uh, this, is, this has been a game changer for soda, uh, for, for summits on the air, for parks on the air. Uh, it's a tremendous little radio until the next one comes along. I also brought this to Nova Scotia this summer. We worked off one of the beaches at one of the couple of the lighthouses. And again, made, made contacts every time we set up. Uh, we had, ended up meeting a fellow who had been the, the Canadian consul for the US, uh, lived in, in Wellesley, Mass for, for 20 years. Knew some of the same folks in the fisheries industry that I knew, uh, and who had a, 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 an uncle who had been an amateur. Uh, next. Uh, this, okay, that shows you the size of the KX-1 and the KX-2. Uh, KX-2 blows a ball away, but the KX-1 is still a fun little rig to, to take someplace. Next. Back in 94, before the volcano on Montserrat went up, we, we spent a week there uh, with a ICOM 730 and a doublet antenna. Uh, had a lot of fun working as VP2MBU. Uh, after a whole year and some months of COVID isolation in, in northern New Hampshire, we were ready to go someplace that was a little warmer. <laughs> so 
in preparing, we looked around and we found out that Montserrat would, would not allow tourists in, but they were allowing uh, people who could work remotely, remote workers. And the reason they wanted remote workers is they got somebody who was going to come and spend money, but they weren't turning. They weren't churning. It wasn't a new person every week. It was the same person. If they could bring them in and keep them without COVID, they could keep, say, as long as they were going to stay and, and not spread COVID. Uh, to get that worker's stamp, we had to have background checks with our local sheriff's office, had to send them bank statements so they knew we wouldn't be a drain on the Montserrat Treasury, had to give them an explanation of, of my job. I told them I was doing independent research in worldwide radio propagation using simple wire antennas. And they said, that sounds really good. <laughs> Can have you talked to our, our regulatory uh, department for radios? I said, yes, and I've already got a license, MDX. Uh, you'll, you'll find, occasionally you'll meet some of the locals, and there aren't many that work on HF, who have a, a two-letter suffix. M is Montserrat, and, and there's a group that are MA, MB, MC. Very difficult to get. You have to be a member of the radio club. I was able to get MDX and I was able to pay for it for the next five years. So I've got that <laughs> now for, for as long as I'm going to be going back. Uh, we, we, found a, we found a great house. Uh, if you go to the next one, I think. No, okay, no, this is getting, getting ready to pack. The uh, thing that on the bottom is a snowboard carrier. But in that snowboard carrier is a fantastic new antenna I found just for this trip. Buddy Pole came out with a very lightweight portable hex beam. It weighs nine and a half pounds, and they're also dealers for mast works, which is a tripod and mast, either a seven meter or a 10 meter mast. The seven meter fits inside this. It has an Armstrong rotator on the tripod, like the old window openers in automobiles. Uh, Propagation would change from the U.S. to Europe, and I'd send my wife out to crank the antenna <laughs> around to point it over towards Europe. Uh, in the yellow case is my KX, my KX3 station, and in the, uh, the, the, the camera backpack is a, a uh, PC, this same, this same computer, uh, my KX2 station, and uh, some cabling. So. The, the backpack and the yellow box came with me as carry-ons. No problem with, with uh, TSAs. The bottom one, with radio antenna written all over it, traveled through safely. I was able to leave the mass works mast and, and tripod there so I don't have to carry them back this, again this next year because we are going back. Uh, through, we, we landed in mid Mid-January, for that first year of COVID, Montserrat had one death. Somebody was 95 years old. They'd had 20 cases. All the time we were there, everybody wore a mask everywhere. Their vaccine percentages were not great, but they weren't bad. In the next year, they had one more death, another 90-year-old. They did the best job of any, any small country could in preventing COVID from, from ravaging their, 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 uh, their island. We were able, while we, we were there, with a guide and a local police escort to go in the exclusion zone where the volcano has destroyed half of the, half of the uh, island. The little town that we remember from 1994 was buried under 30 feet of ash and, and lava. Uh, just totally destroyed, nothing will live there again. But the northern half of the island is a tropical paradise. Next. Uh, this shows you, you know, I've got to hear the entire KX3 station fits in a carry-on Pelican case. Next. This is the house we found on Garibaldi Hill. About 400 feet above sea level, a clear shot in every single direction with that, with that uh, buddy pole hex beam. I also brought a 12 meter uh, Spider, spider beam mast, and I used that with a 88 foot doublet for 30 and 40 and 80. Next. 
Every day we had rainbows. This is, the, this is looking towards uh, the southern U.S. from the house. Next. It really was DXing under the volcano. Now, if any of you are interested in the, in the history of Montserrat, back in, in the 70s, from 79, or from the, in the 80s, from 79 to 89, Sir George Martin, who was the Beatles producer, started a state-of-the-art recording studio called Air Studios. Over the course of 10 years, Paul McCartney, Sting, Dire Straits, Stevie Wonder, The Police, Elton John, Jimmy Buffett, and many, many more came there to record. Sadly, in 89, Hugo came through the hurricane and wiped it out, just totally destroyed it. Uh, Sir George left and went back to England. And then what, what the, the hurricane didn't destroy, the volcano finished off later. His, his estate and house, called Olveson House, is now a restaurant and a hotel, and it's located on Penny Lane. <laughs> the results, next. Uh, six weeks working holiday style. I still got to spend time with my wife. We still went to the beach. Uh, we, we still explored the island. 1,300 CUSOs, worked six continents, just missing Antarctica. Worked 49 states, just missed KX6. Hawaii, worked 66 countries. Uh, all with the uh, hex beam and the doublet. For next year, uh, we, we found a new house, and I've got, I figure I'm 75, I've got 10 years left. We've got a 10 year lease for the winter for the next 10 years. <laughs> and uh, for those of you who wonder, why Montserrat? Next. That's why Montserrat. <laughs> That's home. <laughs> That's home in the middle of winter. <laughs> okay, now, uh, uh, just a, uh, if you bear with me, a couple words about antennas. Uh, back when I first started getting involved in QRP, I got next, please. I met a fellow named LB W4 RNL, who was a, who was a fellow who really was in, in, interested in antennas, did a lot of research in an antennas, published a lot of his work. Uh, sadly, he became a silent key, and his wife at that time sold all of his all of his material to a company that charged to get access. Well, since then, I found now that there's a station in Belgium that has most of it. Uh, HTTP colon backslash backslash o n five a u dot b e slash cbic uh, and the rest. And I can give this to anybody who needs it later. Every one of his works is on there. He and Fred Bonavista taught me the benefits of a 44 or an 88 foot doublet fed with 300 ohm twin lead. Uh, the 44 foot doublet works 20 through 10. The 88 foot, 80 through 10. Uh, hang it as an inverted V, hung from a tree or from a mast or even a sailboat mast as I did with a little KX1. Uh, it will always get you QSOs. Uh, and as long as you, also, on the, some of the smaller ones, as long as you've got an ATU, you can use as little as 28 feet of, of wire for a radiator uh, with a six, 12 to 16, it's not inch, it should be feet, 12 to 16 foot counterpoise. Use a BNC to binding post adapter for QRP and you're, you're in business again. Uh, Pactena, and I've got one up here, has a very, very useful N fed, 29 feet N fed with a 9 to 1 un un. Uh, hang it any place, throw it over a bush, throw it over a tree, and again, you're in, you're in business. Next. Elecraft, uh, during COVID, Wayne didn't have much to do because they couldn't get parts for a lot of the radios they were hoping to build. Uh, he started working on short antennas to use with portable operations. Uh, this that I have here is the AX2. It's 20 meters, but you can modify it just by changing the coil length inside for, for uh, 17, 15, 12, or 10. Uh, there's also an AX1, and with the coil, uh, this coil, you can work 30 and 40 meters as well. 
and it's tiny, tiny vertical. Use a, a counterpoise with it, 12 to 16 feet again, and you're a business. First day I got my AX1, I set it up on the deck with one of the small radios, five watts, and I worked Bulgaria, uh, Romania, and Slovenia in about five minutes with this big of an antenna and five watts. Next. A uh, couple words on licensing outside the US. Uh, first of all, for Canada, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, you don't need a license to go to Canada. As long as you've got a US license and you carry that license with you and proof of identification, you can operate any place in Canada. Uh, I've operated throughout the Maritimes, up into northern Quebec and other places. Nothing else needed. You don't have to tell them you're there. Just sign portable VE1, VE2, VY1, VO1, wherever you are. Also, the, the um, Conference on Postal and Tele Telecommunications, uh, a worldwide agreement, a number of countries that that recognize U.S. amateur radio licenses. So you can, you can operate in, among other places, all across Europe, having just a copy of the SEPT agreement, your U.S. license, and your passport with you. Again, you don't have to notify them that you're there. Just set up and operate as long as you have the paperwork with you. Uh, the, the, if you the fine print is some stations recognize only the extra class, um, or advanced, uh, others will allow general class. Most of them allow general class to operate in their HF bands. Next. About uh, four or five years ago, way before I even thought something like Ukraine was gonna blow up, we were looking at a, a, a expedition cruise that would start in Nome, Alaska, and go all the way across the north of Russia ending in, in Murmansk, stopping at Wrangell Island, stopping at Nova Zemlya, stopping at Franz Josef Land. Now I knew from SEP that back then I could, I, could, I could operate as long as I had permission. I couldn't get anybody to tell me if the radio and I went to Russia, we both come back. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we, we canceled that idea, it'll never happen now. Next. Cruise ship operating. First, you have to ask if the cruise ship, if the cruise company will allow amateur radio. A lot of them don't. A lot of them don't want to even deal with it. The ones I've found that are, are, are helpful are Holland America, Viking, and Lindblad. Uh, but first, you have, to, you have to make sure the cruise line will allow it, and then you have to have permission of the captain. And usually that'll entail being able to explain that if you're operating shipboard, what kind of an antenna you expect to use. You'll only be allowed to work QRP while you're on the, on, on, unless something else is, is taken into consideration. Uh, they want to make sure that other passengers are safe from RF. Um, and if the ship, you have to be licensed in the country that the ship is registered in. For example, when we went to, to um, Australia, the ship was registered in the Bahamas. So I had to first get licensed as C6 Alpha Papa Fox. And when we were on the ship in international waters, I was C6 Alpha Papa Fox stroke maritime mobile. When I was operating in Australian waters, because through SEP I had Australian privileges, I was C6 Alpha Papa Fox stroke VK6 or VK8 stroke maritime mobile. Now in CW that gets awfully confusing. <laughs> uh, the, the big thing again, the captain has to approve it. Now on, the, on this last cruise to, to Australia, I, got, I established a really good rapport with the captain. I was able to site a permanent spot for amateur radio operation on the ship in the ship's library. I got permission to install a 53-foot N-fed with a 9 to 1 un, un that connected through the hull into the library. And a friend of mine, W3EMD, Buzz, uh, 
the next year operated around South Georgia from the ship Maritime Mobile while it was in Antarctic waters. So you can do it, you just have to ask, ask ahead of time and plan ahead. A, a license from the Bahamas can take you six months. So if you're doing something like that, start way ahead of time and, and start there. Uh, Viking, uh, two years, three years ago, we went on a Rhine cruise with Viking and I got permission from Viking and from the captain to operate the KX2 with this antenna on the top deck. And I, I got to work it for about three days until the Rhine got too, too deep, or the waters got too high, and they had to close the top deck so we could make it underneath the bridges. So it, it shut down my amateur radio operation. Uh, but I did get to work on the ship for about three or four days. And that's all I have. Thank you. I'm, any questions? And from the, uh, from the trip to Montserrat, I got a CQ article and a French page. So, Fair, how many countries have you operated from? DFCC. I want to say 30 or 40. All through the many different islands in the Caribbean, uh, Central America, uh, the, the one trip to uh, the Canaries, which counts as Africa, uh, all through Europe, uh, Canada, uh, Hawaii, Alaska. Uh, there's still some more I'd like to work. <laughs> Where did you operate from in Bermuda? Bermuda, I operated from the beach. Victor Papa I, I, I Nine. Where did you, uh, where? From VP9 GE. Oh, okay. There's usually, sometimes it's a good story to think about the time when everything went wrong. Well, I, yeah, I've got one of those. Uh, <laughs> one of our, well, one, one of the, I, I, I shared with you, Antarctica was, was a great trip, but amateur radio wise, with the cooperation I got from the ship, it, it was real drudgery. Uh, the other one I remember is our first trip to St. Martin. I had bought a Hustler six band trap vertical and radials. And I had gotten permission from the resort, the Pelican Resort, to set up my station. They sent two of their maintenance people up to help me put up my antenna. I got on the air and I was working all over the place, three or four days straight. All day long, CW. All of a sudden, one day, there's a knock at the door. I open the door, and it's the head of maintenance. He said, I'm ZS6 whatever. He's a South African ham. He says, I run the facility. They put your, station, your antenna next to our TV relay. The entire resort is listening to your CW. <laughs> <laughs> so we moved it and, it, and it, and it worked. No sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, no sense of humor. Make friends. But it, yeah, it, it, and the radio has, has I've, I've had folks come up to me when I was operating to ask questions. What, what's this all about? Last year we were on, on a, at a lighthouse on the coast of Maine. I'm blanking on which one it was, but I set up on a picnic table with a little KX2 and I was working, working a fellow in, in Georgia, U.S. Georgia. And all of a sudden, I look up, and I've got 30 people behind me. <laughs> I've got earphones on. They're all like, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, I'm talking to Russian submarines. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yes. What is the, uh, the process that you have to go through for getting licensed in like other countries? Not necessarily Canada, like you said, where it's a pretty much a one Okay, if it's, it, the first place to start is the ARRL. They have a reciprocal licensing desk. Uh, one of the things I, I meant to ask Fred if I could get on this meeting the other night and I missed it was the last few years they've not staffed it very well, and I, I don't think they've put the, the time in keeping the records up, up and current. But they've got a list of every country in the world and what you have to do to operate if you can operate. Uh, 
one of the other one of the other times we went to Costa Rica, they had changed their licensing system from one part of government to another. It had left the first one. It hadn't reached the other one. They weren't set up. I contacted six Costa Rican stations and I said, what do they do? What do I do? And they said, at this point, nobody cares. Just come and sign portable Texas India 8. <laughs> but the AWRL lists all of them. SEP is a, is a huge thing. It's so easy with all of these. Uh, some of them, like Montserrat, you can, you can work with a SEP license, but you'll be your call sign portable VP2M. Uh, to get a Montserrat license, you need to apply, pay your 20 bucks, and you get the license. With a, with a VP2M call sign? Well, yeah, with a VP2MDX. And then th to make sure that, because it's only for a year at a time, to make sure that I didn't lose it to somebody else coming in, I paid for the next five years. <laughs> so I figure every time I go and I'm successful, I'll pay another year and I'll, I'll still keep it. The, the license for Nevis, I, I, because of a change in their, in their uh, licensing system, I got a letter saying I had that for life, Victor 47, Juliet, Romeo. The same thing happened in the Falkland Islands. I think I mentioned earlier, I have the VP, VP8 DML for life, but I don't know how I can afford to ever go back there again. Yes, it does. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's, it's, it's uh, Victor Force 4 for St. Kitts, I believe, and Victor Force 7 for Nevis. Anything else? Thank you. You've been great. I'm, if I took too long, I apologize. <laughs>